This is a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful evening, everybody. We are so excited and we're so unbelievably grateful this evening. Thank you for joining us. Indigenous Ways acknowledges the traditional owners of country throughout Turtle Island and pays its respect to their elders and past and present. present. We'd like to take this time to acknowledge uh, the traditional owners and ancestors of these lands we reside on here in Santa Fe, New Mexico. We are on and surrounded by 19 pueblos and we'd like to acknowledge your uh, ancestors as well and traditional owners of where you're beaming in from so we could all be here today and indigenous ways is dedicated to bridging cultural exchange with people globally this evening we have a very special guest I can't even believe we have her we have Marley Shabala Marley Shabala hails from the lands of the Navajo people and the Pueblo people. Marley Shabala has been involved with journalism, writing, media for over 30 years. I started reading Marley Shabala's articles when I was still living on the reservation and I wanted to be a journalist because of her. She was one of my uh, role models. And uh, so this evening we have Marley Shabala I've got a lot of questions and a lot of things I want to say about Marley, but instead of you hearing from me, why don't we just go ahead and say, good evening, Marley. How are you doing this evening? Oh, yacht A, yacht A to everyone. And I'm doing really well. I, um, I, I forgot to let you know that I actually got my second um, shot, my vaccine today. And, yeah. and I'm feeling, yeah, I'm feeling good. You know, it's, you know, I'm, it's good. Well, congratulations, Marley. We're so happy that this happened for you because uh, now you can not be so uh, rigorous about being with somebody else in the same space when both of you have had double vaccines. So I think we can take oh, yeah. our masks down in those situations. Oh, that's wonderful. I'm so glad because you have to stay safe for us, Marley, because you need to stay well so you can continue to do this beautiful work you're doing. So can you tell us a little bit about your early beginnings? My my early beginnings, um, well, well, first, you know, um, you know, in in I think in, in, in everyone's indigenous way of life, we always recognize uh, the sacred beings, you know, especially the, the air beings um you know our, our land you recognize the land you were on in santa fe and so you know out of that respect you know to recognize the airways i'm going to introduce myself to you know in, in the way that i was taught you know to also honor who i am and, and my grandmothers and so on so um yate a marley shabali and shla tohe glini and shlo nanas esha chatanet bashachin and what I said was, you know, my label is Marley Shabala, but who I am is where the waters come together. And I'm born for frog. So my mom is, is Dene and my dad is Oshawi, which is um, Navajo and then um, Zuni on my dad's side. So I just want to say that. And as far as, you know, my early, how I got into writing, it was, very um it wasn't i didn't realize that i had that i was going into writing at the time because um later on i learned that if you're going to be a writer you have to read a lot and so when i was when in, in my early years maybe around oh maybe i was about four or five around there my mom and my dad moved up to Brigham City, Utah, because that's where the work was available at Intermountain Indian School. And my mom was a nurse there and my dad worked in, in the dorms. But being out there, um, and it was, it was a boarding school, it was a huge boarding school. And, but I wasn't allowed to go to school there because my, my parents worked for the school. So I went to school at the public school and it was a, a big public school. And, and I remember um, there weren't that many other um, 
Navajo children there, or you know, a lot of the other tribes worked at the Intermountain Indian School. And so that's when I learned, you know, that racism was taught at, at a very early age as a child. Um, and, and this was like in the first grade and, and children were just cruel, you know? Mm -hmm. Grew up hearing, you know, um, you're, you know, you're a stinky Indian and just the worst kind of, you know, it was terrible. Anyway, so as a result of that, and then trying to be friends with some of them, you know, one of the young, the little girl, she had red hair. She was very popular in school. And for some reason, she took a liking to me. So therefore, you know, I had an in. And so I remember going to this Easter party with them and they were making these Easter hats. And I didn't know why they were making Easter hats, you know. That was foreign to me. <laughs> and, um, and I guess, but that's, I guess what you do on Easter, you wear my hats or something. I don't know, there's something about Easter hats. Just, anyway, so we were doing that and, and I just didn't feel like I fit in. So I just stopped hanging out with them. And my mom though, really wanted me to have friends. And so after school, I would go to the library but I would tell her that I was going to my friend's house. So I would go to the library and I would read because it was, it was a safe place. It was right across from the school. And, um, you know, and, and so I started reading and what I was reading was Sherlock Holmes, the actual Sherlock Holmes books, you know, with the little letters, you know, and, um, and I was fascinated by it. So look at me now, you know, I'm an investigative journalist <laughs> and I'm a writer and I love writing, you know. Um, I remember when um, I was doing the stories about KTN and getting shut down by then Chairman McDonald. And, mm. um, and he put a lot of pressure on me. Um, and at one point I was removed from my position as news director at KTN. I was KTN's first news director. Wow. And I was doing the news and it was being translated into Navajo. And so the people were getting news, you know, of what was happening oh, yeah. at the Capitol by their um, elected officials. And, and that was really very threatening to then McDonald. And, and so as soon as I was done with my, my morning news, which, I did like for almost a half hour because I also did sports and I remember doing sports and I hadn't, okay, I'm going to admit, I didn't know any that much about sport. So there was like triple A, quad A. So instead of saying triple A and quad A, I would say A, A, A. <laughs> and then <for> quad A. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm not a sports writer. So um, anyways, so that, that's, you know, kind of, um, but the early years, yeah, you know, it was, it was that was reading a lot and understanding early on because I, I, I became very observant, you know, of how the children were treating each other, how they were treating other, other children who were from other tribes that were there at the public school. And, and the old, when we had to ride the buses, there was older, um, there were Mormon kids, you know, white kids, they were white kids, mm -hmm. and, and there were boys, and they were the ones that would um, really, you know, taunt us, pull our hair, and this is on the school bus, and, and the bus driver never did anything about it. Okay, there's my five minutes, so let's see, here we go. Remember you told me to not speak over five minutes, and I was trying to turn it off? Okay, okay, this is ridiculous. All right, there we are. <laughs> You're so natural. <laughs> nice. Keep so anyway, going. but as, as far as that story, it was, and I don't know if anyone's talked how you can talk about that kind of experience with boarding schools. Mm -hmm. And even like, you know, just where our, our parents were forced to go off reservation jobs. And I hear that repeatedly on the res on, in the council and by the office of the president and the vice president. And they make it sound like that is just happening now, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's been there historically. And the mistreatment of indigenous people, 
here on in our homeland, our own homeland. You know, it's um, it, it's not talked about. But I went through that and I saw it. And as a result of it, because my brothers would stick up for us and, and the older boys, older indigenous boys, you know, they were the ones that were disciplined and kicked out of school. And so my older brothers had to go to boarding school, you know, because of that racism, it tore apart my family. So that oh. was, you know, just learn. And I think because of those experiences, that's why probably I'm just so outspoken about transparency and truth because they, people need to know the truth and it's history. It's not legend, you know, it's not our legend. I hate it when people refer to our history as legend. Yeah, it's, thank you for that, Marley. It's always uh, disconcerting to think of ourselves as subordinates. And there's many different groups of subordinates on a global scale. And it's just so uh, disconcerting. I think that's the word that comes to me. So aside from that, uh, as I noticed that your clans are Navajo, wa water flows together, Tohetlini, and your father's clan is the Frog Clan coming from the Pueblo tribe. So uh, being the Navajo, uh, being nat matrilineal and the Pueblo being patrilineal, does it feel like maybe you were born into the proper way of being or have you ever thought about that like what if your mother was uh pueblo and your father was navajo or can you talk about that a little bit and educate us about that well if if um yeah if it was in reverse i definitely wouldn't be a news reporter <laughs> Because news is like 24 seven, you know, mm -hmm. um, and, and my hours are very, one time I, a friend of mine asked me, what time do you go to sleep? And I and just re naturally said, you know, when I get sleepy and, and he thought I was being funny, you know, and it was like, and I thought about it and I thought, yeah, you know, I just kind of have to go with, if I'm hungry, I have to eat whenever I'm eating and like you said, you know, get something to eat and something to drink while I'm sitting here. And that's what I do when I'm writing. Mm. And so it, it's sometimes I end up getting up at four in the morning to file a story. Um, and then we had to move up our deadlines by 5 a.m. And I'm talking about what um, I do as a, as, as a journalist. And then I have a blog. And so I do a lot of writing. It, 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 um, the theme is keeping an eye on Navajo government. And so I'm letting people know what, what's happening within the committees. Like if like today they were supposed to hear a report um, about an um, ombudsman and, and that's federally mandated as part of the 638 contracts. And yet this administration, the Nez and Liza administration removed that. And so I had to do a lot of research on on that part of the contract so if i'm not writing i'm doing a lot of research i'm reading i'm listening to news and my aunts out at zuni they're they um during ceremonies i try to go over to try to help and when i wasn't a reporter i was able to do that and and it's because the hours and and now even with the covid there is such a demand by our people for their voices to be heard, not because they want their voices to be heard to promote themselves, but they want their voices heard by the Navajo government. And, um, okay, that was the next, let me see here. Okay, that was my five minutes again. <laughs> mm, I keep going, it's all good. So, you know, it's, they, um, they, they start preparing for, like the Shalico, at least sometimes two years or a year ahead, which is the same for us with the major ceremonies. But it's huge because we're not just, you know, with like the enemy way ceremony in our summer, any of the big ceremonies, you're always feeding people. Mm -hmm. But with the Shalico, 
you, you know, people come in from around the world and different tribes. And so you, there's constantly food being prepared and there, and there are certain families that have to accept it. And if the women aren't there to support that individual who stands up, the, the man and it's decides that they're going to found their family is going to do it it's going to be difficult because of that and they're the ones that prepare all the gifts too for the um the sacred holy beings for coming and and praying and letting us hear their songs and and be around them and they also are the ones you know that that have the teachings the um, stories the history because they have to understand when to bring food, what food to bring, um, who whose home it goes to, it it it's it's huge, um, and and people don't know the inner workings of that. And even you know, I remember one year I went out there early when I was um, in college, and I helped out fixing up the um, the ovens. And, and that's what they have to do too. And just, you know, um, getting that ready, you know, building a huge fire in it and cleaning it out and then, you know, getting the bread ready. And, and so it is, it's a lot of work. They, they contribute a lot to that ceremony and I, I really admire them. But um, that was not to be, you know, for me. And, and I think each of us, we know it, like you were, you were, had talked about a little bit with me regarding that you have <clears throat> wanted to be a journalist, you know, mm -hmm. but your talent is, um, is singing and the way you sing and what you're doing now too, you know, reaching out to people, you know, these different artists and you're sharing who we are, you know, bringing our voices out. And my voice, I guess, is a layer of voices, you know? Mm -hmm. And, and so, um, each of the the within each of the, the the indigenous nations the women have different roles and i remember there was a big discussion when they had the, the women's liberation movement you know our mm -hmm. our non-indigenous sisters and and that um was interesting because from our viewpoint indigenous viewpoint the 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 raising of a child is is a huge responsibility. Can you, you know, this is a, a, a human, little human being and you're responsible for it and you're, as women, you're blessed with it. And, and the moment of having that child, you're in between this physical world and that other world because it's so sacred. And, and that's how sacred those beings are. And so in this debate over women's liberation, or even if women prefer to stay at home or in a way are responsible for being home, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. They're not Absolutely. obligated, they're responsible, just like our elected leaders are responsible in that way, you know? Yes. And as a journalist, I'm responsible for making sure my, my stories are accurate and they're that field and the truth is there and a variety of voices are there for people. I'm not trying to educate people. There's a difference between educating and helping people to understand. Nice. And, and I'm trying to do that so that they can make a, a uh, fully informed decision. Mm. However they want to do it. And so that's what I mean. A lot of work goes into that. And there's just no way that uh, that lifestyle, um, yeah, it just, it, it's difficult right now, you know, even for me um, and, and my family, you know, but I, in the early years, I think I went overboard with journalism. <laughs> and you learn, you know, when people tell you keep in balance, that's what they mean. You know, don't go overboard on your work, your family, yourself, you know, just yeah <laughs> you're very passionate about it marley so that's very obvious because it comes through in your work i was looking at your website Dinaire resource and 
uh, infocenter.org, and you guys can see it right underneath uh, Wisdom Circle. Uh, right, right here, you can see it. And check it out. Marley's got this Diné resource and infocenter.org. And there's a lot of information there. And it's a very user-friendly website, I found when I looked at it. So uh, that's wonderful. So the next question I had was, uh, I got a lot of questions for you, but I know we've got a limited time. So COVID happened last March. It just like overnight, we heard something, we were told something, and then all of a sudden, all this happened. And then how did, how can you tell us about the effect, effects of COVID-19 on the reservation? Uh, that you experience as a journalist and also as a person on your on a personal level as well and has there been any positive outcomes amidst the tragedies um very sad for the losses we've had and the sicknesses we've had but what about mother earth you know the cleansing less traffic less uh, uh poison into the atmosphere with all this uh, crazy stuff that's going on with so many people driving cars and all that kind of stuff. So uh, have you noticed that maybe there's less DUIs or something like that? In uh, making um, understanding what happens out here on, on the reservation, off reservation, there's a lot of data that you can look at and go through and see what's happening. But here it, it's always been, it's just ridiculous why, uh, <clears throat> why you just have to do everything possible to get documents. And um, it, it's sad because if they had truly been transparent from the beginning, they would have had the social media skills. There would have been um, fiber optics in place the local governments would really have had their internet services set up with widescreen. Um, and there would have been availability of, of libraries out there. And also, you know, the internet and places with, if you have a library, then there's a place for students to go. And then they have little rooms in libraries where they could even have, you know, virtual classrooms. Um, or even allow the elders, you know, to be able to get online maybe and visit with a grandson or a granddaughter who's overseas in the military. Even allowing for, you know, in the judicial system to be able to, you know, our people, the, the high, the unemployment has always been around 50%. Mm. And people get outraged outside of the reservation or any of the Indian nations when it gets up to what, 12%? Mm -hmm. yeah. And ours is always at 50%. And so when, when that feeds into how people can access information about what the government is doing. And the reason I'm talking about all of this and, and COVID is because that's what it's about, right? getting information out about what was COVID in, in our language, in the Navajo language. And being able to do that um, effectively, efficiently, and even having meetings, press conferences. And who has been doing that from the very beginning? You know, you see it on C-SPAN, but not here. Why? Because they wouldn't even give a news reporter a public document that was discussed in a public meeting. You know, and I'm sitting there listening to this whole thing and I get up and say, could I have that document or that report? And it's like, no, you can't have it, it's confidential. And it's like, you just discussed it, you know? I pretty much tape recorded it, but it'd be good if I had the hard copy, you know? Right. You know, you voted on it. And your public servants and all this has been, you know, I'm just ranting and raving. And of course, I never get it. But, you know, at least that's my frustration. And they can't help it either. You know, the legislative staff. 
because and and this is across the board, you know, with governments and this government and all of the governments that the Indian nations have. It's not our government. We had our own government, um, and it was taken away from us by the federal government, the U.S. federal government, as they waved the American flag, and they came back hand in hand with corporations to, you know, exploit our land and all indigenous lands at a cheap price. Yep. You know, because we refused. We said, no, we don't want it. They went to the northern area and, and we had early, the earliest EPA laws because when they went there, they were questioned, you know, well, what is that that you're asking to do? You know, tell us about it. Where are you going to put it? Where do you want to put this? Or we're going to put it over there. Well, what about the people that live over there? Well, there's nobody over there. We don't see any housing or buildings or anything. Well, that's where we have our ceremonial grounds. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, okay, what about over there? That's where we get our water. What about over there? Well, that's where the four legged live. Well, what if we give you money? What's money? When you look at those early records, you understand how self sufficient we were and we were independent. So we can get back, we can go into that again. Now, I'm not going to say go back, but we can, we constantly learning and moving and we've got to move forward and do that because this um this virus like other viruses like the hantavirus those were the result of climate damage that's early climate damage not climate change and when the hantavirus occurred then Chairman Peterson Zah, who came from out at um, Navajo Mountain, which is a really remote area. And, and you know where that's at probably, huh? I do. Yeah. So you know that area and how when you say that it's in a remote area, the teachings and are, are uh, very still very strong and intact. And so... When the Hanta virus hit, his upbringing had him call out to the Hatafnis and the healers, the herbalists, and he set up the sports center, told them he was going to take care of everything, but they needed to come together. He put a place together for them and close it off to everybody so they can sit and talk as long as they need to about this haunt of virus and what is it and what how do you deal with it you know what caused it you know what's what's the healing and so they did they got together and they came out and they talked and said you know what it was and it was the rodents mm -hmm. and how it had traveled you know wow it had traveled from a place that was called the haunter river in in korea and we had the Korean War. And so we go over there, our, our people, you know, and they come back. And so they talked about how when we do those things, we have to be careful. Mm -hmm. You know, about bringing it back in. And, and that's why, you know, the, the, our, our men and women who go to war have to have the cleansing. And, and get them back into the you know way that they they were before they had to go to war and do things in war that you don't do otherwise except in war. And so all of that is what I'm talking about. These series of events, it's history, but I've written about it. Mm -hmm. And and it impacts us. And we have to, that's what I'm talking about. Even though this is going on now and there's a light at the end of the road or what is it, the light at the end of the, over there, <laughs> um, that um, we still need to really work on how, how to communicate. That's always been our basic, that's what we always do, you know, as Diné people or, or even as, as uh, Zuni people. We have ceremonies and everybody gets together and we sit and eat. 
you know, if you were, if we were here right now, all of us, you know, with your interpreter, Elena and, and you, you know, um, we'd be sitting here, we'd be talking, we'd be eating, you know, we'd find more food and we would just keep on talking, you know, right? and, and really talking about issues. Maybe we go off on something else and we come back to issues, you know, and we talk about history in our families. And that's all part of it, too, of who we are. And so when this COVID hit, they started criticizing our way of life. That we, that we live in clusters. And that's part of, you know, who we are, you know, as, as the Nev women. Um, we have a home and then from there, the female children, you know, they'll grow up and they'll have their homes nearby. The male mm -hmm. children, they're gonna grow up and then they're gonna go somewhere and get married and take care of homes over there. But we tell them you have to take care of them too. You know, it doesn't mean, you know, we're giving them to you, you know, we, this is our son, you know, you know how that goes. So mm. all of this, you know, and then the grandchildren and, and that connection and, and how we keep each other standing and moving. It may not be true for everybody because of, of what happened with us, with the boarding schools, which never ended um, and continues. And, and that's a whole nother level of, of modern mentality boarding school whitewashing and everything else but in, in going back to our history and what we have to think about if we can keep this kind of communication and keep improving on it we have to keep improving on it not because our elected elected officials and i i really don't they need to earn the title leaders mm. they need to understand that traditional term of leadership and sacrifice. I hear them sometimes saying, nobody says thank you to us. And, you know, we do all this stuff and nobody says thank you to us. And I think about this story about this, um, this man I used to work with at the Navajo Times and he came in one day and he said, my twin daughters, you said they had um, their uh, puberty ceremony with Kinelta. He says, and, and I was there, he says, I was, I was the only man there sometimes, you know, fixing the wood and keeping it going. And he was just really going on. About what he did. And, and then, you know, I waited and to see if he was done. And he, and he was done. So, I, you know, I looked at him, he looks at me, you know, and I just said, well, you're supposed to do that. You know, you're the dad. <laughs> you know it's like you know that's what you're supposed to do you know you're a dad if you're a mom if you're a sister or brother you know understand what that really means you know do something and you don't expect then to have somebody i say thank you to you for doing what you're supposed to do which is your sacred responsibility and duty and helping your daughter you know so that she understands who she is and she will know how to protect herself. She will understand the term seduction, you know, and, you know, and, and all of that in, in dealing with the missing and murder, tying all of that in, you know, in, in getting our women to be really strong in their mind, you know? Yes. And so with this social media, that's what I'm talking about. It can be used for those families yes. that can't make it to those ceremonies. And it, make it where it's private and within the families, they don't record it, you know, those parameters, but also helping to get communities connected. Mm -hmm. Because right now, people don't know what's happening over at the chapter house, which is about maybe a mile from here. I'm not gonna say what chapter house, but um, because I, I, I walk around to the neighbors and, and talk to them. Oh, okay. and, and, and they don't know what's going on over there. And it's difficult. The only way you can find out what's happening at the 110 chapters is to go to all of their websites. And, and so they're starting to announce when they're, when they're doing distribution for food, you know, protective gear, vaccinations, 
um, um, you know, flu vaccinate, anything going on in the community. There's nothing in that community that connects them where they can go out. Hmm. But this would be a way that what you're doing right now, you know, you're in Santa Fe. I could have the same conversation, but I would be on the other end interviewing somebody in the community that is knowledgeable about what is happening on that community. Yeah. And, and how people, you know, you can use your cell phone to do this. They can make little short videos with their cell phones and even use Facebook Live, you know. Maybe somebody is, you know, they want the meeting at, at the chapter, you know, showing how it's done or, you know, an artist came in or they were going back, whatever they want, you know, within that community. Wow. But, but they need that assistance in helping to understand it. And, you know, it's something yep. that can be taught and, and it's very usable, but we they need the backing of the Navajo government. The Navajo government should be able to put on their website how much they receive, how much they're spending. Yes, absolutely. I agree with you totally. And, you know, I know that one of the big incentives with the homeschooling because of the coronavirus is the access to the Wi-Fi signals that really <clears throat> is supposed to be like a priority so that everybody in their hogan on their sheep camp from Sawmill to Black Mountain to Lukachukai, uh, Round Rock, you know, everybody's at home with their family. They can just turn on their laptop and have their instruction from whatever school they're not able to attend. And then again, come to think about what about training the Navajo people how to use this technology, especially our elders and some of them that don't speak English. Somebody come in and teach them the basic about how to communicate with each other on FaceTime or Facebook video so the families can see each other. My biggest concern is the elders that are isolated by themselves with no access. Oh, yeah. It would be nice to for the tribe to give them a laptop and teach them how to, you know, call their grandkids so they can at least talk to each other while they eat their mutton stew and uh, talk about everything that's going on. But since we're uh, moving on here, uh, Marley, thank you for all that information. This is really good information to know since you're actually there. And I wish I was there. I'm very homesick for the Navajo Nation. I wow. love it. We're going there tomorrow, but we'll tell you about that in a minute. Uh, finally, I want to ask you a question. What do you feel about uh, Deborah ha uh, Deb Halen's new appointment in D.C.? And how do you feel that is perceived by Native people, not only on the Navajo Nation, but how do the Pueblos feel, particularly uh, that, you know, Pueblo is uh, patrilineal and she's a woman and she's in the highest post of any Indian ever. Can you talk about that a little bit? What does that mean to you? What she has done is, it's a, um, an answer to, to our prayers. <clears throat> it kind of reminded me, in a sense, of some of our, our stories about how our people make prayers and ask for help, you know, to, to the Holy Ones to send someone or, you know, some way, somehow to help us. And, and, and that's her, you know, because otherwise they, they forget about us. As a journalist, I remember when the, when, when, what happened with the political dispute between then Chairman McDonald and the council and the mainstream media, I was being contacted because I was working at the Navajo Times that time. And then also at the Farmington Daily Times and at KTNN. So I was getting contacted a lot and and a lot of those mainstream media did not know that indigenous people were still alive and well in the US. And so she, she's a reminder that we are alive and well in our thoughts. And they did not want her. You know, immediately there was, there's been stories, you know, of investigative reports of how the congressional people and, and congressional people, you have to look at, you know, I wish you had a photograph of all the faces 
of Congress, and they're, they're a, a bunch of old, I mean, old, ancient white men, you know, balding, um, you know, you know when, you, when I say white, I, they really are white, you know, and these guys are billionaires. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know? boy. and um and how do they become billionaires and you look at their policies and it's always been anti mother earth mm. anti people you look at the way they treat their own people you know what do we, you know, we think they're going to treat us equal never mm. you know so they're Deb jealous of us they've been jealous from day one and and deb Hallen. She's an indigenous woman on top of that. Yay! Yeah. Yay. All right, sister. You know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We're pretty. Do, do, are you familiar with her title and what she's going to be doing? What oh, her... yeah. Yeah. Secretary of the Interior. Mm -hmm. She has. That is where the, you know, assistant secretary sits. And, and when, when the, the, the Gold King mines still happen, that's who had to come out and talk and when was held accountable. And, and, you know, and they brought forward the US EPA under the Secretary of the Interior. That's the land. That's Mother Earth. That's mm. that's our sacred water, the fire, the air. Wow. Beautiful. That is just too exciting. I'm really excited, too. So I'm glad we're on that page there. Uh, finally, in this time. 35 generations of her people and she's uh meant to be there she's meant to be there she is meant to there. be there she's and, and we better be there. keep an eye on her let them oh, know keep praying for her let's pray for her so yeah. finally before i invite other people to join us i'd like to ask you our theme this year is thriving in purpose can you tell us what that means to you marley thriving in purpose means that whatever your gift is is that you continue to take care of it and you use it no matter how hard it is to carry some gifts we get are very hard to carry and so we have to be careful about what we ask for from from the sacred holy beings but always you know if we if we continue in that mindset you know we're thriving because just keeping that connection with with our grandfathers, our grandmothers, our holy sacred beings, you know, they, they recognize us and it makes them feel good and, and they're thriving. So we're thriving, you know, like you were talking about how the clean air with this virus, there's always, you know, the the yin and yang, like our, you know, our, our um, other indigenous relatives talk about, you know, there's always that balance and it's always going to be there. So you have to decide what you're going to do, which one you're going to, which path you're going to take. And, Beautiful. and you have to, if you're going to thrive, you always take that, that path, you know, and it's called different. Some people say it's a red road, the pollen road. We all have, you know, terms for it. Yes, absolutely. Marley. Well, gosh, Thank you so much for being with us this evening, Marley. And we're going to uh, do a quick commercial break, and then we're going to bring some folks back on if they have some questions for you. And uh, here we go. Already. Thank, thank you so much for that, Marley, and sharing your incredible wisdom, blessing each and every one of us for the purpose and how you have been thriving with your passions to keep us all informed. Uh, on the reservation. Thank you. Uh, so if you've joined us, welcome. You have just heard the amazing Amali Shabala, who will be back again uh, just after this. So on Saturday, it's the third Saturday of the month, which means we will be having the beautiful sound healer, Tori Trujillo, who will be joining us at 3 p.m. Mountain Standard Time. So be sure to tune in, same channel and so forth. We'd love to see you and uh, feel the amazing, incredible sounds of this extraordinary person. 
amazing, amazing, amazing. And uh, if you have just discovered Indigenous Ways uh, Wisdom Circle, every we hear every Wednesday live, 6 p.m. Mountain Standard Time, and on the third of each month uh, with the concert series at 3 p.m. Since the 1st of April 2020, we have been able to support over 80 Native American, Indigenous, LGBTQIA artists, musicians, presenters. We're very honoured to be able to do that. Where you can find all their amazing archives is at our website, indigenousways.org. And also you'll be able to see the extraordinary people who will be coming in in the future at that website. You can also join our a newsletter uh, so you can hook up and hear what is also happening. In the next 24 hours, you'll be able to share this video of the amazing Mali Shabala and her incredible wisdom. Uh, so be sure to do that. And then flashing below us is all our social media. So if you're blessing us through the social media at this moment, please be sure to like our page. Uh, we would absolutely appreciate that. And then all of these events have been free and all of the events have AXL ASL interpreters uh, because we believe in making access available to all. So we also want to thank our sponsors who include the Native American Advice Fund, the Santa Fe Community Foundation, West Staff, and New Mexico Arts. And also to all of you who come and have watched these. And not only that, those of you who have been able to support us as well. Thank you, thank you, thank you for keeping us here and making this possible. We also want to give a shout out to our incredible Indigenous Ways board and our uh, individual donors, as I was saying. So a lot of you know that uh, tomorrow and Friday, we will be heading up to the Navajo Reservation and we will be doing a two runs, one to the deaf and hard of hearing community in uh, McKinley County, which is Shiprock, and the other one to Mount, uh, Black Mountain, where Tasha's family are from. Today, uh, we had the most people we've ever seen for over a year, uh, 20, over 20 people bless us and help pack the 150 boxes that we will be taking up uh, t over the next two days. But we want to give a shout out particularly to Meow Wolf. Uh, they had a, a lot of great team that were here behind the scenes. Also to Mogro and the Vegan Outreach for all the produce that's going up. The New Mexico Foundation, the Native American Relief Fund, Colorado Creating Change and the Beauty Way Foundation and to all the incredible volunteers that help box these 150 boxes and also to each of you who have given through the website to make this happen. Since we started at the end of May, we've been able to raise over $75,000, which we've been able to make uh, this run. This will be our ninth run going up. If you do want to uh, give to make this possible where we can keep doing runs, uh, well, you can go to our website, indigenousways.org. There's a nice donation button or any of these. But thank you, thank you, thank you, everyone, for making this possible uh, that we're able to not only bring community together, but help community. As uh, Marley was mentioning, you know, to raise a child, it takes a village. And so we cannot thank each and every one of you for making this reality a possibility. So everyone, come on in. Uh, say hi to Marley. And uh, if you have any questions or just want to be seen, please do. And if you're on social media on one of our sites, uh, Facebook, Instagram, you're welcome to type your questions in for Marley or if you want to say anything to her and we can uh, pass that on to her as well. So, welcome back in, everybody. Hello. Yeah. Hey, hey. hey. Or if you've got a question, as Tash was saying, just shove it in the uh, box. Yep. Okay. We've got Christine McDee to everyone. Thank you for sharing with us tonight. Thank you. 
And uh, is everybody, anybody coming in? Is anybody having a problem coming in? Ah, oh, Miss uh, Michelle saying we cannot get in. Okay. All right. Have a try now. Sorry. Let's try it now, everybody. <laughs> Facebook. <laughs> Facebook. Okay, Elena. <laughs> I'm glad no one gave up. Like, what's wrong with my video? <laughs> right. Sorry, you mob. It's great to see you all. Yeah, I would like to start with uh, Christine Bueno. Thank you for being with us from New York City. Oh, wow. Yeah, oh, hey. New York City. Wow. This is our sister. Yes. Hi. Hi. So I'm really grateful for everything that you've shared this evening is a very interesting. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And thank you. Interpreters. The interpreters were wonderful this evening and in rendering all your stories. Oh, that's yeah. I saw that. Yeah, I saw that. That's wonderful. And you're in New York City. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yep. I live in New York City. And, you know, people in, out um, in Spanish um, Harlem area. Oh, well. okay. In the Upper so, East Side. So um, how was that I'm living there? I'm originally from, or, from L.A. and I moved here back oh. in 1976. So I've been here for over 35 years now. Okay. <laughs> I love that. Thank you, Christina Bueno. Thank you very much. We love you very much. You are one of our most ardent supporters to this show. We really appreciate you. And because of you, um, a lot of wonder things, the wonderful things continue to happen just from who you are and your walk in New York City. Really appreciate everything you do as well, Christina Bueno. Uh, teaching other people ASL so they can have more awareness. Oh. Yeah, thank you. All right, let's go on oh. to uh, Michelle Mormel. Oh. Hi, Michelle. Thank you for being with us. Marley, thank you so much for your story. I am curious about your experience when you went to the, the officials and you wanted to get the paperwork like you had already gotten their their information, but they would not show you the paperwork. I'm wondering if that was a function of the misogyny more than anything else. I'm curious about that. It, it's it's not that. It at one point you have to understand that within indigenous um, the the indigenous modern government. They're not our government. So your question about whether or not it's misogynistic, it is. And because it came from Washington, it's, it's very, um, the, the, the thinking back then, and that's where I, I have always had this interest in, in history is that at that time you have to look at the thought of, of how women were being treated, the non-Indigenous women, yet alone the Indigenous women. Mm -hmm. and, and even to this day, there has, an, I don't know if it's been recent, but even within the, um, within the congressional documents, recognizing women as equal, that hasn't, you know, been been really pushed through Congress, you know, and when they had the the um, Violence Against Women Act, it was the men in Congress who were holding it back, and the different Indian nations wanted that moving forward. And back to your question of whether or not that was based on that, it's it, it, again, it goes back to the federal government and any government and why journalist, journalism was created in the non-Indian world. In the non-Indian world, it was created to be the watchdog over government. In the non-Indigenous world, there was no need for that 
because our indigenous way of government was very open. Our leader was a Hatafli. And whether or not people believe it out there or not, it doesn't matter. But our Hatafis are specifically, are, are chosen in, in a way not by humans. So there's no popularity voting or trying to buy votes, you know, none of that can happen in, in our traditional government. And in the traditional government, our, our chief does not go outside. He will, if he's like, if he was invited to Washington and we were still within our traditional government, he would send a representative to Washington. Mm. And then that representative would come back, but he would always stay at home to make sure that everything was, was going as it should, because he had the way of, of the knowledge and wisdom to protect the people, to also take care of them, meaning he knew the prayers for the rain, for the farms, for the animals, all of that, that, that life chain, that circle. And so that was our indigenous leadership. And so going back to what I have to deal with now, which is a non-Indigenous leadership, they've learned well, you know, from the old white men in Congress <laughs> to hide as much information as possible, <laughs> but to, to look at the same time as transparent as possible. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah. All right, we got uh, Julie Kaufman. Thank you for being with us this evening. You, Julie says to you, Marley, thank you. Thank you for sharing your wonderful experiences and knowledge, Julie. And Bri Goodrunner says, you. <laughs> All right. <laughs> and uh, Carrie, who's with us this evening, uh, she was here helping us pack today. Thank you for your wonderful work today. Yeah, would, you yeah, like, yeah. would you like to be the last word this evening, Carrie, before we uh, call it an evening? Uh, sure, it's my first uh, time in this group, and I really appreciate the invitation and warm invitation. I, it's been a few weeks, and then I got ner you know a little bit shy about coming. But um, I would I have a question: Is like, do you do you have hope that now that there's Deb Holland in government, will your you think it'll trickle back down to getting your government back a little bit? I don't think that Deb. Holland really has anything to do with the return of the indigenous government. It's going to have to be we ourselves to do that, you know, hold our, our elected officials responsible, you know, and, and it's difficult because I think with all any citizen here, you know, it, it's difficult to sit there and listen to them talk and understand what they're saying and read 800 pages of legislation. And do we have the time to do that? Not on, on the Navajo Nation. People are hauling water because they have to, they need to, that's the only way. And they have to spend most of their money on doing that. So there has to be a way to get that communication out to them and what Deb, Helen is doing is, is dealing with our homeland and, and the animals, the four-legged, the ones that crawl, the ones that fly, the ones that live in the water, all of those. And, and one of them, you know, um, again, you know, this virus, they say, you know, or they're saying, you know, some of them come from the birds, from the animals. And so we've always had hope. That's our way of life. We were told when we were taught, you know, you get up, you go out in the morning before dawn or at dawn, you know, but you get out there, you know, with your, your offerings and you pray, you know, in a real positive way. And that's how come we were here today still, you know, we were, we were taken and, and made to cross the Rio Grande River down to Fort Sumner down in New Mexico. And it was a raging Rio Grande. And so many of our people didn't make it to the other side. And they did that on purpose to us because they wanted to get rid of us. And, and they want this land. That's why they want us removed is they want the land. And we're part of the land. 
and and people sometimes don't understand that when we say that and and we try to teach our non-indigenous relatives you know and you're and you're helping support us so we try to you know let you know that you're connected you're never disconnected from because you breathe air and we breathe air you know and you can understand me and you know we're female but we di- we look different and there's female species of four legged insects everything you know so we're related like that as sisters all of that the fire the air the water all of them have female in it everything the clouds everything and so when you're living like that and thinking like that you have to have hope you and we always had hope and that's why we've survived and that's why we're always going to survive we it's built into us it's built into our prayers <laughs> awesome well thank you very much for your question uh carrie and again thank you for your support today and we're really looking forward to getting to know you and uh, welcome to our nonprofit indigenous ways Uh, This is the end of our show, everybody. I'd like to thank everybody that's been here this evening, Uh, everybody on Zoom, our social media sites, and those that's where we get most of our audience coming in from and those watching the recording in the future. We'll be putting that up in 24 hours. Always grateful for our ASL interpreters who rock so hard. Oh my gosh, they rock. Yeah, we love you. (laughs) <laughs> Thank you for being with us and uh, see you uh, Wednesday, March 24th. Saturday. Actually, Saturday, we've got a beautiful Tori Trujillo. She is freaking amazing. She is an amazing singer songwriter. She's also into the healing arts. We're having a Saturday concert at three o'clock with her. And most of all this evening, we are so grateful that we finally got to hear the words of Marley Shabala. Now, this is a woman <laughs> that has read a lot of books, has been to a lot of ceremonies, and has done some amazing work to be who she is with the mind she has today. She has a beautiful mind because she's earned it. She's earned it and she's worked it and she's practiced and practiced and practiced and practiced. So now she's a real pro, real gem for the Navajo people and the Pueblo people and all people. Thank you very much, Marley Shabala. We all love you so much. Please know that. Let's give it up for Marley. Give it up for Marley. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Take care, everybody. We love you.